Hallelujah. So we're talking about the governor. The governor. Yes, the governor. Uh, so many things connected to the Spirit of God. And I'm going to tell you just a little bit about why this is so important. So last week, just to, let me go back in my notes a little bit last week. So last week we talked about uh, the whole purpose of God. The whole purpose of God, well, first we had to recognize what happened to man. In the beginning in Genesis, we recognized that man fell from the kingdom of God. So he fell from the kingdom. When he sinned, he basically declared his independence from the kingdom of God, and he declared his own independence to himself and to his own will. So now his will would triumph over what it was that God had willed for man. Because of that will triumphing over God, now God, in the very beginning, puts a game plan in place to what we call redeem, redeem man back to the kingdom. So the re, the, the, uh, the prefix of re means again, which means that there was something that we had that we lost in order for God to say, I got to give it back to you again. So the whole purpose of what God did with Jesus was he brought Jesus online because he needed Jesus to give back to us the redemption that we lost from the very beginning. We could not get that redemption back any old kind of way, but we had to get it back based on the parameters in which God put in place. God recognized that it was the blood that was able to restore, refresh, clean, deliver, all those things. And so in the Old Testament, they would use goats and lambs and everything else without spot or wrinkle. And that would take away the sins of the people for a period of time. But after a period of time, they had to come back in, bring more goats and bring more lambs and bring more whatever they got in order to receive that freedom from sin. So God says, listen, this thing, I'm so glad. Aren't you glad God had Jesus? Because could you imagine us coming to Sunday service with goats and lambs and all kinds of craziness? Boy, that's crazy. So you should be excited about the time in which you're living in. So he said, I'm going to bring Jesus to be my sacrificial lamb for all of mankind. So now you can have an opportunity to the kingdom of God because of what Jesus did. And so we give so much effort and energy into celebrating the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, which we should because it's very important. But we should give just as much thought process to what took place because of what he did and because of what he did the spirit was able to come on the scene and so we talked about last week that the spirit of God is the governor now what is this governor well when you have a country like Great Britain Great Britain was a country back in the day and they came over here and they noticed that there was all types of lands and islands here so because of those lands and islands they said we want to colonize and take over these lands so in order to take over the lands, they came to the island, they established their government. When they established their government, they took someone from the home country, which was England, and they put them in the country in which they wanted to colonize. To colonize means to transform and to change the attitude, the mindsets, and the government of a country to how it is in the home country. So now the governor, which was put in that, that uh, colony, was put there because he was responsible for changing the culture, the attitude, the government, and the mindset of this new country that they had found. Yeah. Right? Okay. So the important piece is that's what God now did for us. He brought forth the governor, which was the Holy Spirit, and he put the Holy Spirit in a body, which was Jesus Christ. That's why when Jesus was on the earth, you did not see the spirit doing anything outside of Jesus because Jesus was, the Bible says, full of the spirit. So all of the spirits that was available from the kingdom place was all inside of Jesus. That's why when Jesus spoke, that's why when he walked, that's why when he did whatever he did, he had complete control and command over everything because he was getting power from the home country, which is heaven. So now Jesus said, it's better for me that I leave you. And they're like, well, wait, wait a minute. We don't want you to leave. And he had to tell Peter when Peter started messing with him, he said, get thee behind me, Satan. Why? Because he recognized Peter didn't understand that if Jesus stayed, the spirit could never dwell or enter into another because he was 
full of the Spirit. So Jesus recognized that now that I'm leaving, you've got access to this Spirit that I've left behind. And because we are not God, and we will never have the fullness of who God is, the Spirit has the ability to be in all of us at the same time. Wow. And that's where we're starting on today. So we first got to recognize and understand that God has a purpose and a plan for our lives. We've got to now follow God in a way that we've never followed him before. God has brought the spirit here to colonize. To colonize is a verb, which means come to settle among an established political control over people in a particular area. So the mindset of the governor is to come and establish a political control over the people in a particular area. So this is why in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, he says, and the government shall be upon his what? Shoulders. He's talking about Jesus. It's the prophecy of Jesus. He's talking about this because he wanted us to recognize and understand that truly Jesus did not come back to establish a religion. He did not come back to establish a religion. There are so many religions that are out there. You got Buddhism and Hinduism and, and uh, Confucianism and Scientology. And you got uh, all these, you got all these religions. And you even got Christianity. But Jesus did not come to establish a religion. He did not say, listen, I want to establish this religion and I want you guys to have this thought process on what it is you believe. No, he came and lived and died and resurrected so that therefore he could establish his government in this country. So you could, so he could establish it. Now, how is he going to establish it? He brings the governor and he puts him here. So that's why he says, listen, I, the, the government shall be upon his shoulders. And Jesus said, it's better for me to leave because when I leave, now you have access to something that you've never had access to. The governor is sent to lead the people. The governor is sent to lead the people. Now, the governor believes that the system and resources that they have are better than the systems and resources that you have. So think about it like this. When Great Britain went to the Bahamas or went to Jamaica to take over, they didn't just go in there and just take over and say, hey, you're going to do things my way. No, they went in there and said, listen, we believe that we have a way of life that's better than your way of life. So not only will we get a benefit because we're taking over this country, but you will get a benefit because now you will get access to resources and things that you never had access to before. Now you have access to them. You have the ability to obtain things you never had the ability to obtain before. That's what the governor does. He comes down and says, listen, I know you have a life. I know you have a system. I know you have a government. But I've come so that you can have a way of life that's better than your current way of life. And because I'm bringing resources that are valuable to you that will allow you to live a life that you cannot live on your own and by yourself. I have things that are available that are way bigger than the things that you have available for yourself. And if you lean and you trust in me, I will give you those things that you need in order for you to be successful. So let's go to Luke chapter 4, verse number 1. Luke chapter 4, verse 1. Hope you got your pens out, your notes out, because we're going to be giving you some scripture that's going to be a blessing to you on this morning. So he says in Luke chapter 4, verse 1, he says this. Then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit. Somebody say filled. filled. Being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So the Spirit is a leader. The Spirit is a leader. The Spirit has been sent. The governor has been sent to this country so that therefore he can lead you. Lead. Lead. Now, if the Spirit is leading, what do you got to do? 
Right? If the spirit is supposed to be the leader, you've got to follow. There is nothing worse for a leader than people that do not want to follow. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about you got that person just as rebellious as they want to be. And you trying to find a way how you can get them off your team. <laughs> because they are doing no good. Because that one person can destroy the fibers of your team. The one, the one person that's not willing to follow can destroy everything. Can you imagine being in a boat and everybody's rowing in their own direction? Because nobody wants to follow. Everybody wants to be the leader. But the Bible is clear that the Holy Spirit led Jesus. Now, this is important that you understand this, because if the Holy Spirit led Jesus, how much more should he be leading you? If he led Jesus, how much more should he be leading you? Now, you're saying, well, hold on. I thought Jesus was God. Then why did Jesus need the spirit in order to lead him? Okay, well, let me tell you exactly why that's the case. Because in your, your New Testament, you recognize that Jesus went in the Old Testament, excuse me, Jesus needed a body. So the body of man is subjected to the principles of this world. The body has limitations. The body cannot be in multiple places at the same time. You never read in your Bible where Jesus was in multiple places at the same time. Now, Jesus might disappear on you and go somewhere else, but he never was in two places at once. So because of the limitations of the body, what took place was is that God had full of the spirit in the body, but it was the spirit that was leading the physical, natural body. See, you are a spirit first, and you have a body. You're not a body with a spirit. You are a spirit with a body. So when you recognize that you are a spirit, your spirit is leading and guiding your body. And so God says, I need you to subject your spirit to his spirit so that therefore his spirit is now leading your body that he's given you. And so the, Jesus understood this. And so Jesus said, okay, there is complete submission to the Spirit of God because that's the only Spirit he had in him. So when it said that the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness, it was the Spirit that Jesus had, which was only God's Spirit, that led his natural body into the place that God had called him to go. It was his Spirit. So if Jesus was led by the Spirit, we should be led by the Spirit. He was full of Spirit. Now, a good leader don't just want to, to be in charge. A good leader's purpose is not just to be in charge. They don't just want to have control and be in charge. Now, there are some leaders that just want to be in control, and they just want to be in charge. But those leaders are never good leaders. They're never good. If your intention behind you wanting to be a leader is to be in control and be in charge, you cannot be a good leader. But a good leader wants the best for their people. The Holy Ghost is the same way. The Holy Ghost is an amazing leader because the Holy Ghost's intentions are always to get the best out of his people the people that he's leading. And so the Holy Ghost always positions you for the best. So let me take, let me, uh, take a, a stab at this thing and tell you a little bit about the Holy Spirit who's, who's our leader. Why do leaders, think about this, why do leaders get paid more than the employees? Why do they get paid more? Because the leader has a greater level of responsibility. The leader always has a greater level of responsibility. So the more people you lead, the greater your responsibility. God sent the spirit of God to lead who? Everybody. The people that believe, God sent the spirit. The people that don't believe, God sent the spirit. The people that live it right, God sent the spirit. The people on drugs, God sent the Spirit. God sent the Spirit intentionally for everybody. 
regardless of what you think about it, regardless of what you believe, regardless of how you walk, regardless of how you act, regardless of how you talk, God sent the Spirit for everybody. Everybody, not just so sometimes we come to church and we see people and maybe we see somebody speaking in tongues or or maybe we see somebody, you know, they feel like they're full of spirit and they think, well, oh, God might not have did that for me. He didn't do it for me. No, 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 no. God sent the spirit for who? Everybody. He didn't leave nobody out. The spirit was sent for everybody. So God's responsibility is everybody. The leader is responsible for developing their employees. They're responsible for development. The spirit, guess what? Is responsible for what? Development. The leader is responsible for teaching. Guess what? The spirit is responsible for what? Teaching. But you have to be teachable. <laughs> you got to want development. You know, sometimes people come to me and say, uh, at work, you know, they come to me at work and say, you know, I just want to see what I need to do to get to the next level. And I say, okay, well, here's some things that you need to do. They say, because I feel like that my leader, they feel like my leader, this is what they said, tell me. They say, my leader, my leader, my leader is holding me, what, back. I, f I hear that. But my leader is holding me back. I say, okay, well, what does that look like? What have you done? Well, I mean, but they haven't. No, no. I didn't say what they did. What have you done? Because, see, if you want to be developed, right, then you have to be intentional about your own development. The responsibility is not on the leader to develop you if you don't want to be developed. You have to raise your hand and say, leader, I want to be developed. And so because I want to be developed, this is what I'm willing to do. Because of my desire of development. So if there's deadlines, I got to hit the deadlines. I got to put the extra work in. If I got to work at home, if I got to, you know, uh, study at home, if I got to do more things, guess what? I've got to do it because it's my responsibility for me to be developed. The leader is available in there, but the leader is not going to continuously try to put something in you and believe in you more than you believe in yourself. Why don't they be a leader? Okay, well, then stop coming to me and looking for leadership development. Can I be real? Because if you don't believe it, how do you expect me to believe it, but you don't believe it? And you want me to work harder than you're willing to work for yourself. Right? And that's how we do our leader who is the Holy Spirit. We don't put any work in to read. We don't put any work in to study. We don't put any work in to pray. We don't put any work in to worship and give God praise. We don't put any work in, but yet we're expecting to receive something for us not doing what God has told us to do. Amen. And the leader is looking at you like, well, what if you done did? You didn't do nothing. Yeah. You can't speak to the mountain and say, be thou removed and cast in the sea because you don't know the scripture. Yeah. Right? We've got to do something to receive the spirit, to recognize it, to understand it. All right, let me get not go. I don't want to get tied on there for too long. So the, the leader or the spirit is responsible for teaching us. A leader is responsible also for inspiring, inspiring. So what does the spirit do that inspires? You see the spirit move in someone else's life. That should be inspiration. You hear the story of what someone was going through and how difficult it was. And then all of a sudden God came in and God restored. God set free. God turned it around. God made it brand new. And so that should be inspiring. And you just got to take those nuggets of inspiration and say, if God can do it for them, God can do it for me. I tell people my story all the time at work. Why? Because I'm looking to inspire them to say, listen, 10 years ago, I didn't even think I could be here. But guess what? If God can do it for me, God can do it for what? You. And so now that should inspire you to say, okay, then I got to go get my word together. I got to go start understanding what God has said. I got to start believing in God. I got to start changing my life. I got to start doing the things that God told me to do because now I'm inspired to do it. See, people inspire other people. The Holy Spirit is not an it, but a person. And the person of the Holy Spirit inspires us with the work that he does in our lives and in the lives of everybody that's around us. So when I see him do something awesome in your life, I get inspired. Miss Tianti came up here three weeks ago and she said, listen, uh, you know, I got promotion. And guess what? I said, guess what? I'm believing God for mine. 
I said, there's a promotion spirit that's in the house. That's what I said. Y'all remember promotion spirit. And so I'm believing that God is releasing something. And I have expectation because I've been inspired by what God has done in someone else's life. God, the leader is also responsible for coaching. A leader is responsible for recognizing people. That means, that means uh, congratulating, recognizing them. And there's also the leader is responsible for holding people accountable. Now, this is the one that we don't like. This is why we don't like leaders. This is why we want to be the leader. Because we don't want to hold ourselves accountable. And we don't want nobody else to hold us accountable. And we get mad when people hold us accountable. Are you with me? We get mad. Well, wait a minute. How are you going to do that? Well, how about XYZ person? You ain't do nothing about them. What does that, that do about you? Even if they didn't do nothing to the other person that did the exact same thing, that still don't give you the right to do the wrong that you did in Jesus' name. And so you wanted everything to be fair and consistent. You No, you don't. That's what I'm saying. What I need to say is you don't want God to be fair. Because if God is fair, I'm telling you, we'd be toe up from the floor up right now. We'd be beat down, up, left, right, front, back, and center. But because God is gracious and merciful, he gives us an opportunity to continue to live. Because the first time you sin, God can say, done. Done. D-O-N-E. Take you out the game. But God is so gracious and merciful. All right. So here is the Holy Spirit is. Let me tell you a couple of things that the Holy Spirit is. And then we're going to get into the meat of what we're talking about today. All right. So the Holy Spirit is. Man, time just flies. Holy Spirit is the most important person on the earth. The Holy Spirit is the most important person on the earth. The most important person on the earth. That's who the Holy Spirit is. That's who he is. He's the most important person on the earth. Most important person man lost. So the Holy Spirit is the most important person on the earth and also the most important person that man lost. So that means the Holy Spirit is available, but everybody can't see him. Everybody has not found him. And I'm going to tell you why he's so important here in a second. Solutions. The Holy Spirit has all the solutions of the world. All of the world's problems. The Holy Spirit has the answer. Coronavirus. Holy Spirit's got the answer. Politics. Holy Spirit's got the answer. Issues with North Korea. Holy Spirit has the answer. Taliban, the answer. Uh, ISIS, the answer. Every answer to every problem and every situation is already answered and the Holy Spirit already has the knowledge of it. So this is why it's so important that you connect it to the Spirit. Because without your connection to the Spirit, you have no answers. And my people perish for the lack of? Knowledge. All right. Somebody know their word. The greatest promise God gave to man was the Holy Spirit. He said, listen, when I leave, I'm going to send the comforter. And when he comes, he's going to dwell in you. That's the greatest promise he gave us. The greatest. I'm going to tell you about why that's so great. Jesus' goal was to restore. Restore. Now, the only way you're restoring something, because that which you stored, you no longer have. Right? You don't restore something when you still have something. You restore, you know, like we go to the grocery store, and we restore boxes of cereal, because we eat a lot of cereal and milk in my house. We probably go through almost two gallons of milk a week. Right? So we got to constantly restore milk and restore very large boxes of cereal. Right? We restore them because we, there's no more cereal there. So Jesus' job was to restore the man back to the kingdom. And the only way he could restore man back to the kingdom is through the inhabitants that man can have with the Holy Spirit. You cannot get access to the, to the kingdom any other way but by the Spirit. Now, if you read your Bibles, which we, we've gone through this before, but I just want to give a, another reiteration. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except you come through him. Now, does anybody seen Jesus this week? Anyone? I mean, was you at your workplace? Was Jesus there? 
When you went to the grocery store, did you see Jesus? Some people went out of town. Did you happen to see Jesus when you went out of town this week? No, you did not see him. Why? Because Jesus is no longer here. So how can Jesus say the only way you can get to God is through him and he's not here? Well, it's because what he left behind, which is still here, is the spirit. So that means the only way I can get to Jesus is through the Spirit. And the only way I can get to the Father is through Jesus. So when I connect to Jesus, or when I connect to the Spirit, I get Jesus. And when I get Jesus, I get the Father. And when I get the Father, I get full access to the kingdom. <laughs> because of the Spirit. Now, you can't bypass the Spirit. I don't care what they teach in anywhere else. You cannot bypass the spirit because Jesus is not here. Ain't nobody seen Jesus for 2,000 some years. He's not here. Okay? All right. So now that I've given you all that, let's talk about uh, a couple of things. Let's go to Joel. Joel chapter 2 verse number 28. Joel chapter 2 verse 28. And I'm going to kind of go quickly here because there's somewhere I want to go, and I need to get there quickly. So Joel chapter 2, verse 28 says this. He says, and it shall come to pass afterward, and it shall come to pass when? Afterward, right? So this is a prophecy. So Joel is not talking about what's going to happen right here, right now in the Old Testament. He's talking about what's yet to come. So he says, and it shall come to pass afterward, I will pour out my spirit on what? Somebody say, all. Oh. Say all. all. See, you should just shout right here on all because this means you. <laughs> this means you. He didn't say I'm going to pour out my spirit on some. He didn't say I'm going to pour out my spirit on most. He said I'm going to pour out my spirit on who? All. all. That means every single lottie dotty everybody has the ability to inhabit and receive the spirit of God. He said, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. Then he says, your sons and your daughters shall what? Prophesy. And your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see vision. Now, this is important because God is saying here, not only will I pour out my spirit, but because of the pouring out of the spirit, there's some things that will start to happen in you that can only happen when the spirit is poured out. He said, old men will dream dreams. What is the dream of the dreams? Well, see, see, when you get older, you start to dream things, things that might not come to pass in your lifetime. Oh, my God, you got to get it. But when you're young, you have visions. Those are things that you're dreaming about that God's going to do in your lifetime that's going to be brought to pass. And so now when I become older and I start dreaming dreams, now I can set up the young men and their visions for the dreams that God gave me. And so now I can be a part of what God wants to do in my life because I'm connected to the spirit that has been poured out on all flesh. Yeah. He said, I'm pouring the spirit out. I'm pouring the spirit out. I'm pouring the spirit out. God has made it available for all. Somebody say all. all. He's made it available for all. Why? Because we all need a savior. Let's go to Psalms chapter 51. Right fast. Write those scriptures down. Psalms chapter 51 verse 5. Look what he says in Psalms chapter 51 verse 5. He says, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity iniquity. And he says, and in sin, my mother conceived me. So he's saying right here, you was birthed into sin. Ain't nobody had to teach you. You was birthed into it. You were birthed crazy. <laughs> you ain't got to teach, you ain't got to teach no two-year-old how to be, decept be deceptive. Right? You ain't got to teach them how to be deceptive. I mean, they just come out the womb deceptive. Amen. Don't touch that. And they looking at you like this. I mean, it, it just, it's in them. Yeah. And why is it in them? Because of the sin. And so God said in Psalms chapter 51, verse 5, he says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. In sin, my mother conceived me. So every single one of us was birthed into sin, which means we need a Savior, which means we have to have the Spirit in order to connect with the Jesus that connects to the Father that's connected to the kingdom. 
That's the only way you get to where you need to be. Every other religion at any type. See, that's what I'm talking about where God, he's not, he doesn't want us to just have religion. He wants us to have a government, a way in which rulership is over us so that we can receive what we need now. See, it's not just about me dying and going to heaven. See, if you read your Bible, you'll see where God says, we're not just going to go to heaven and be there forever. But there will be a new heaven, which God will still be rulership over. And he says, and a new earth that you will be on. Call man. Amen. See, the songbook says, I will fly away. Oh, Lord, I will fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I will fly away. And we think that's it. You got to read your word. Your Bible says that you will die, you will go to heaven, and then there will be a new heaven that God will still have rulership over, and there will be a new earth that you will still be rulers over. Come on, boy. Y'all better get in that thing. That's what God is setting up here. So he says, I need you to know that you was birthed into craziness. So therefore, every single man, woman, boy, girl, you can't be good enough. You can't be. You can't be good enough if you started off crazy. This is a scripture that tells you you started off in sin. So when people say, well, no, you don't understand. I'm a good person. I'm, I'm good. I'm a good person. No, you're not good. The Bible says that you was birthed evil psalms 51 5 remember that one when people start talking about the, the good person say oh well you know here in this scripture it says that you was birthed in iniquity from your mother's womb Amen. right i love you <laughs> right did you got but, that, but i'm telling you you have a lot of people say i'm good i'm good i'm good no you're not good all right so here we go so this is why we need a savior. So in Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8. Oh, good. This is good. I hope you all getting something. It's getting it's going to get better in a minute. Romans chapter 8, verse 12. Look at what he says. Romans chapter 8, verse 12. He says this. He says, therefore, brethren, we are debtors. <laughs> We're in debt. He says we are in debt. And look what he says. We're, he says not to the flesh. So we should not be in debt to the flesh. That means when the flesh say do something, you should not be in debt to the flesh. Well, my body says, you know, I know we're supposed to be fasting this week, but my body says I need to eat, so I'm going to eat. That's being indebted to the flesh. Well, you know, I know I should be giving my tithe and offering, but I, I don't feel like giving my tithe and offering. I need to use my money on something else. That's being indebted to the flesh. So he says we're not to be indebted to the flesh, but to live, a, uh, to live according to the flesh. He says, for if you live, in verse 13, according to the flesh, you will what? Die. Everybody say die. die. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. Now, he's not talking about a natural death here. What he's talking about is a spiritual death, so therefore you have no access to the, to the spirit. Oh, my gosh. This is the scripture that says when you act crazy, you get nothing from God. Amen. Just go ahead and keep asking all you want to. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Because you are indebted to your flesh doing things that are completely opposite of what God's called you to do. So he says here in verse 13, he says, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put the death, the deeds of the body you will live. That means I put the body, the physical body, under subjection, and so now I can live because it's not me that's living, but the spirit that's living in me. Why is the spirit living in me? Because it's the spirit that's leading my flesh and my body to do the things that God has told my flesh and body to do. Are you with me? Verse 14 says this, for as many are, somebody say led, for as many are led by the Spirit of God, led by the Spirit of God, led by the Spirit of God, these are who? Sons of God. Oh, my God. So go to Isaiah 9 and 6 real quick. Go to Isaiah 9 and 6. He said, for any that are led by the, by the Spirit of God are considered what? Sons of God. He didn't say sons and daughters. He said sons. Everybody categorized in a single nature. Now, let me tell you why he says sons and he doesn't say daughters. This right here. 
He says, because unto us a child was born and unto us a what? Son was given. So the child was born because the child was natural. The son was given because the son was spirit. Oh, so God is saying, guess what? Now, when you are led by the spirit, now you become a son of God because now it's the spirit that has taken over you. And now you're no longer who you are in the natural. You are now spirit led. There's no gender in spirit. Oh, come on. There's no gender. That's why he said here, a son is given full of the what? Spirit. So he called you sons of God because there's no gender in spirit because now your spirit is truly leading your outside frame that we call a body. <laughs> Woo. Man. So he says, God Jesus was the son of God because of the fullness of the spirit. The son was given the natural body. Jesus was led by the spirit. Now, let's go to Galatians. Hope you all getting these scriptures. Amen. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 through 18. Because I need to make sure y'all go back and take a look at these. Amen. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 through 18. He says, I say then, walk in the what? Spirit. So if I'm led by the spirit, I've got the ability to walk in the spirit. Now, he says this. He says, walk in the spirit uh, in verse number 16. Uh, then he says, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So how do I stop doing all this crazy stuff I'm doing? You got to walk in the spirit. And you can't walk in the spirit until you're led by the spirit. You can't walk in the spirit until you're first led by the spirit. So now, because the spirit's leading me, I'm automatically walking right behind the spirit. Able to do supernatural things. Able to change every area of my life. Because I'm walking behind the spirit that's leading me. I'm being led by the Spirit. I'm being led. That's why you have to be led. If you're not a good follower, it's not going to work for you. Because God's intention is that you get led by the Spirit. So he says, um, uh, uh, if you walk in the Spirit, you will, shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Look at verse 17. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not uh, you do not do the things that you wish. Verse 18. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. So you've got the ability to stop doing whatever it is that you want to stop doing. Start doing whatever it is that you want to start doing as soon as you get led by the spirit. So if you're tr if you got troubles with things, you I don't know, I, don't, I just can't overcome this. It's just the way I was born. It's just the way that I am. It's just how I've lived. It's just in me. That's just my personality. Whatever it is that you've given the excuse on why you do what you do, God has just eradicated your excuse in this scripture. Amen. <laughs> Amen. He said your excuse is the flesh. And the flesh is warring after the spirit. And so because you don't want the spirit to lead you, you keep doing what you're doing. It ain't got nothing to do with how you was living and where you was born and how you grew up and what took place in your life and what they said to you when you was five years old. It doesn't matter if you're a woman or if you're a man. It doesn't matter. None of that matters. The only thing that matters is that if I'm walking by the spirit, I can put aside the things of the flesh. And now the supernatural favor and gifts of the kingdom can now be mine. I've obtained them. So when you're dealing with something that you can't overcome, you got to check your spirit. Where is my spirit? How is my spirit in alignment or out of alignment with what it is God's called me to be? Okay. All right. So, um, so that's that one there. So 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians, oh my goodness, this is good. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, this is when it gets real good right here. So hang on, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we're going to go to verse number 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6, look what he says here. He says, however, we're talking about the spirit, the governor. However, we speak wisdom among uh, those who are mature, 
yet not wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. So he's basically saying here, you can get wisdom, uh, you can get wisdom you need, you can't get wisdom you need from natural sources. Right? He says, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age. That means it's not wisdom based on natural resources. He says, nor of the rulers of this age. So that means you can't listen to people. Now, it's very interesting how everyone's got a mindset and a, a philosophy or a theology on how you get saved and how you get to heaven. How can you have the knowledge of heaven if you was born crazy? You can't get that knowledge from you. You can't get that knowledge from you. You can't give somebody something that you never had in the first place. So therefore, the only place that you can go to get the knowledge of what you need is from God. And the only way you get it from God is if you get it from the Spirit. That's the only way you get it. All right, let me go through this. So he says this in verse 7. He says, but we speak the wisdom of who? God. Oh, God. So how can we speak the wisdom of God? Through the Spirit. The only way you can speak the wisdom of God is if you get it from God. The only way you can communicate with God is through the Spirit. So he says, but we speak with the wisdom of God in the mystery, the hidden wisdom of God, ordained before the ages of our glory. In verse 8, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for he, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So he's exemplifying that they did not know because they did not have the spirit while Jesus was here. No one knew. No one had the spirit. So they said, crucify him. I mean, two days ago, y'all was excited because I was feeding you. 5,000 fish, you don't know, remember? And now three days later, everybody's shouting, crucify him. Because they didn't have the spirit, they didn't know. They didn't know what they didn't know. And so now we get to verse 9, it says, but it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. So God is saying, listen, I've done all this stuff, but nothing has come for the people that have, the things that have come and have prepared those for, for the ones that God loves. Verse 10, this is where it gets really good, and we're going to spend some time. He says, but God has revealed them unto us. God has revealed them unto us through his what? Y'all start to see how important the spirit is? He said, this is how it's revealed. So all them folks talking about Buddhism, Confucianism, and all them other isms, guess what? They're talking about those things because they've never gotten a reveal through the what? Spirit. So they create and believe in anything that's taught them. Because for them, it's about what I've been taught, not about what I received from the Spirit. So he says, reveal, 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 reveal. Reveal means to cause or allow something to be seen. There are millions of people that are walking around and they can't see. The same way Paul couldn't see when he was riding on the horse and God knocked him off and now he blinded. He couldn't see what he didn't see. But then when his... When, uh, 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 when they came to him and they restored his sight, now all of a sudden he can see. And he sees very differently than how he saw before. Because now it's been revealed. It's been exposed to him now. The, the, the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things. Look what he says here. He says in verse 10, but God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, even the deep things of God. This is so awesome here. He said the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. The Spirit knows all things, knows all things. The Spirit is omniscience, omniscience. 
You can even spell it like, it's spelled exactly like omniscience, but it's called omniscience, but it's spelled omniscience. Omni means all. Science means to know. The spirit knows everything because the spirit is God. The spirit knows your beginning and the spirit already knows your ending. Already. He knows ins and the outs, the lefts and the rights. You and I will never have all knowledge. Never. But the spirit already knows everything. So why does the spirit have to be somebody that we rely on fully? Because he already knows everything. The spirit already knows how coronavirus will end up being something as common as the flu. Matter of fact, he knew that from the beginning. We worried about it now. Oh my God, what are we going to do? 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 And the spirit's like, what do you mean we're going to do? I've already taken care of it. You ain't seen the manifestation of it yet, but it's already taken care of. Right? So he says, searches the deep things. He searches the deep things. He searches the deep things. He's searching the deep things of God. And so now you got to recognize that the spirit is not just power. See, electricity is power. But electricity can also be very dangerous. Right? Because it has so much power in it. See, the Holy Spirit in, in Acts chapter 1, uh, verse 8, I believe, he says, and we shall receive what? Power when the Holy Spirit comes. But the Holy Spirit isn't just power. The Holy Spirit is intelligence. You know how, like when a country trying to understand what's going on in another country, what do they get? Intelligence. They get information about the other country so that they, therefore, they can make a very prescriptive decision about what they do next. That's the way the Holy Spirit is. Holy Spirit isn't just the power to overthrow, but the Holy Spirit is also intelligence. He has the knowledge and the thought process of what to do and how to do it. And so he knows everything about you from the inside out. The Holy Spirit knows you better than you know you. And so he has the capability and the ability to give you everything what you need. The Holy Spirit is not just uh, omniscient, all-knowing, but he's also omnipresent, which means he's always present, past, present, and future. The intelligence that he has is collection of valuable information. Wouldn't you like to know how to get to where God told you to be? Guess where the answers are? In the Wouldn't you like to know how your children are going to be able to make it through college? Guess who already knows? Wouldn't you like to know how you're going to afford to pay for those bills that you can't afford to pay for right now? But guess who already knows? The Spirit. So the Spirit is intelligence. When Homeland sends a governor to a country, he comes to be innovative with ideas to transform that country into the home country. So his job is to go into that new country and transform it so it looks just like the home country. That's the same job of the spirit. His job is to make it look and feel just like heaven. Where? On earth. That's why he said his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it were. Is in heaven. That was his purpose for us. He wants you to get bought into the idea that he has a better way for you. He wants you to buy in. You're like, well, I don't know. I just got to do it my own way. Come on. He's all knowing. He's everywhere at the same time. He's got all power. Why are you believing in yourself when the spirit Knows everything. Amen. And you're like, well, I can't hear the spirit. You can. You done went to some places and you walked in and you said, well, there's something just telling me I shouldn't be here. That's the spirit. 
There's some things that you was about to do. You said, no, I'm not going to go to work that way this time. I'm going to go to work this way this time. Guess what? That's the spirit. And you say you can't hear them. You say you can't understand it. You say that it's not connected. But it's right there. You just got to work it. It's a muscle. You got to work it out. And the more you work the spirit, the more you agree and call on the spirit, the more you'll hear from the spirit. And the spirit will do more leading and more guiding in your life. He's there. He's in all of us. He said, I'm going to pour out my spirit on what? All flesh. Crazy flesh, lying flesh, yeah. cheating flesh, it's all still available. Yeah. You'd be like, oh, you know, I don't know. You say, something told me. It was the spirit. It was the spirit. Don't try to act like somebody else has got this supernatural power that you ain't got access to. Well, pastor, you know, you just so, you so close. Well, no, you got access to. Well, pastor, tell me what it is that, you know, God's called me to do. You, you got to ask. God might give it to me, but if he give it to me, I give it to you because God gave it to me. But you shouldn't search me out trying to get an answer that God ain't gave me. Well, I got to go see prophet so-and-so so they can give me a word. Why you got to seek them? You got the spirit. Now, if prophet so-and-so come to you and he give you a word, then you take it. In the Old Testament, when the prophets was really running, I'm talking, they was running strong. You ain't had people going to the prophets. The prophets was going to the people. Good yeah. God Almighty. Yeah. But today, everybody want to go see the prophet and find out what he got to say about me. Yeah. Glory. You are exalting the prophet higher than the spirit. You exalt high in the spirit. It's the spirit that got poured out on all flesh. It's the spirit that leads you. It's the spirit that guides you. It's the spirit that you walk behind. It's the spirit that restores. But we're so nervous about this whole spiritual thing. All right, so here we go. You got, you got insider information. I'm almost there. We got insider information. The spirit gives you insider information. The spirit has intelligence that nobody on this earth has. He's got insider information. So think about it like this. If you buy stocks, if anybody buys stocks at all, right, when you buy a stock, there are certain rules that are governed. I work for T-Mobile. I have T-Mobile stock. I got certain rules that are, I got to abide by with T-Mobile stock. I don't have to abide by with any other stock that's out there because I'm an insider. I've got inside information about how our business and organization is doing, which means I kind of already know what's going to happen to our stock price up, down, left, right, front, back. I already kind of understand what that looks like. So because of that, there's only certain times of the year that I can trade, buy, or sell T-Mobile stock because of that. Now, here's the important thing that you got to know. If you've got insider information and you know exactly when to buy because you know the price is about to jump up, you can make a substantial gain. The Holy Spirit has insider information. <laughs> and he is authorized to give it to you. So he can give you the information that you need so you can buy low and sell high. He's got the info. And you walking around trying to act like you got it all together when the Holy Spirit's got all the info. And I'm not talking about just financially. I'm talking about in every area of your life. He knows exactly what you need to do so you can feel loved. He knows exactly what you need to do in order for you to have joy and peace in your heart. He knows everything that's everything that's everything that's everything. And he's got insider information that he can just drop in you like this. You're like, oh, God, that's good. That's what I need to do. And so now, guess what? You have a tactical advantage over everybody else. Because right. it's not even fair. It's not even fair. We live in the same United States. All these people upset, mad, angry about all this political stuff that's going on. And I'm just walking in like, well, it is what it is. I said, but blessed be the name of the Lord. 
Why? Because I got insider information that no matter what's happening in that White House, no matter what's happening in them Congress buildings, God's got my back. God's got control over my life. Whatever's going on with coronavirus, God's got me. God's protecting me. God's delivering me. God is saving me. God is setting me free. Whatever I need, it's all connected in the spiritual places so I don't have to be concerned about what everybody else is concerned about. It is what it is. But blessed be the name of the Lord. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Okay. All right. So we're down the back stretch here. So the devil, his job is to steal, kill, and destroy. John 10, 10 says, uh, the, the thief comes not what? To the kill, to steal, and destroy. But God has come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. What is the devil trying to destroy? He's trying to take, steal, kill, and destroy the spirit of God so you don't believe that the spirit is able to do what the spirit said he would do. He wants to take your knowledge because your knowledge of the spirit. That's what was stolen from you. Just like in slavery days, you know, uh, they wanted black men and black women to believe that they were less than humans. So what did they do? So they called them the N-word. So they considered them not even a person, a real person. They wouldn't allow them to vote. They didn't teach them anything. Why? Because if they would get them in a position of knowledge, then they would start to understand who they are and then kind of take over. So that what did they do is, is they prevented them from obtaining all of what they were trying to obtain. Stopped them, keep them from moving forward. They ensured the dependency was on them and not on themselves. So now, the last thing which I wanted to get to here is Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. Amen. Amen. Pastor P? Amen. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. I want to talk about the speaking of tongues, right? Because... The spirit has a language. We call it speaking in tongues. Now, you can come some places. Come on up. Come on up for me. You go some places. People get really nervous. People get really nervous when people start speaking in tongues, saying, to me, like, oh, my gosh, they're, they're, so, they're so, you know, out of control. They're so spiritual. They're so unholy. And so, you know, so many things. People get so, you know, like, oh, well, we don't do that in this church. And, and maybe we do this in this church. But, see, we're talking about the spirit here. We're not talking about the natural. We're talking about the spirit. So we got Margaret. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. Yeah, yeah. Come on up. You're good. You're good. You're just, you're just going to help me out. I'm going to tell you exactly what to do. It's going to be very easy. I'm going to make it very easy for you, okay? Now, here's the thing with the spirit of God. Now, in Acts chapter number 2, verse 1 through 4, the Bible says this. All right? Let me just read it. Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4 says this. He says, when the day of Pentecost has fully come... They were all with one accord in one place. He says, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. This is the promise of the Spirit coming to them for the first time. Jesus is now gone. He says, then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled. They were how many? all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Okay? So this is something that we go crazy about. The Spirit, the speaking in tongues, it's almost it's crazy. I don't know. I shouldn't have to do it, whatever the case may Let me explain to you. Jesus came to reestablish the government in the kingdom of heaven back here on earth. Yeah. Every government in every kingdom has a language that they speak. Yeah. Are you with me? Marguerite speaks Spanish, Espanol, right? Okay, so now what I'd like me to do is, uh, do you know the Lord's Prayer? Okay, I'd like for you to speak the Lord's Prayer in Spanish. Uh, the Lord's Prayer is, uh, Padre Nuestro, que estás en el cielo, santificado sea tu nombre, venganos en tu reino, hágase tu voluntad, aquí en la tierra como en el cielo, Amen. Now, wasn't that beautiful? Does anybody know what she said? So no one understood her because she's speaking in her native what? Language. Now, where are you from? Mexico. Mexico. So because she's here in the United States, when she speaks to us, she's speaking what? 
English. But if she calls back to Mexico and she talks to family in Mexico, guess what she's speaking? <laughs> because Spanish is the, the language of her home country. So when the spirit comes and he establishes his government, <laughs> The spirit comes with its own language straight from the kingdom of God. So even though you speak in English to everybody here, when you're talking to the home country, God says, I'll give you a new language that you can speak to and you can connect to God in any way you want. And it's a gift that's given. Now, even if you don't believe what she's saying, does that not make it true? It's still true. Whether you believe it or not, it's true. See, we've made speaking in tongues so spooky. We made it seem like it's so scary and, and it's so wild and out of control. And I got to be running all around and I got to be jumping up and down. No, God says I've come to establish my government. My government comes with a language. And now I'm teaching you this language because guess what? When Marguerite is speaking in Mexican or Spanish, you don't even understand what's happening. And God said in the same like manner, when you're speaking in the kingdom language, the devil don't even know what you're saying. He don't even know what you're saying. Because it's going straight to the kingdom. And he don't have no idea what's happening. The same way she just said the Lord's Prayer, it sounds so beautiful, so elegant. But I had no idea what part she was in. She could have missed two or three different lines in there. I wouldn't even know. Because she's speaking in her own language. That's why the spirit is so important. Because the spirit has a language. So now... Speak, do, do it, just do the same thing, do it over again. Same thing. Padre nuestro mm. que estás en el cielo, mm -hmm. santificado sea tu Lord. nombre. Vénganos en tu reino, hágase, Señor, tu voluntad aquí en la tierra como en el cielo. Amén. Mm. Amen. My God. Hallelujah. My God. Glory to God. She got her own language. <laughs> She's speaking to the whole country. She's telling all the people that, hey, this is what my God, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leadeth me behind the still water. Oh, my God. You understand what I'm saying? And so now when God says in the scripture and he says, listen, I, I, I will. He says in um, on verse three, then there appeared to them divided tongues as fire and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance. He's saying that this gift is also belongs to you. So don't be thinking that speaking in tongues is spooky. Don't be thinking it's something weird and something out of control. No, it's just the language of the country and which you're connecting to through the Spirit of God. And if you want to get your language, God will give it to you as well. It don't matter who it might be. It don't matter what's going on. God wants you to be able to accept and get all the gifts of the Spirit. Thank you so much. <laughs> Amen. Come on, give her a hand for helping us out on this morning. So, so it doesn't make sense to you, but it doesn't make sense, but it does make sense to everybody that's in the country. So when she talks to us, she speaks in English, but when she picks up the phone and talks to someone in her home country, she speaks Spanish, getting instructions, getting wisdom, getting love, getting hope, getting encouragement, getting capability and ability, all because of her connection to the Spirit of God. Because you don't know what's being said, doesn't make it invalid. Because you don't believe in what is said it doesn't make it invalid why because it's all in the spirit and the spirit was given to all it was given to all you're not a second class citizen you've got access you've just got to believe it 
You ain't got to be hanging off the, 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 the ceiling tiles speaking in tongues. You ain't got to be running all over like you ain't got no sense, you know, sh- ripping your clothes off. Walking. No, no, no. It's in this, the spirit is a language. He did that shot that out of our seat. That's a language. It's a language that you have. You've been given that connects you to the home country. It says, God, I'm connected. I'm connected. I'm connected. I'm connected. And the God's like, oh, oh, that's my son again. That's my son. He's using the spiritual line. You remember in that old uh, Batman, you know, the commissioner had that red phone. And when he picked up the red phone, he didn't have to hit no numbers on there. It automatically went to the back cave. He had a direct line. When you start speaking in tongues, it's just like you pick up that red phone. And now you got a direct line to the kingdom. And it's not something that's just put in place for a select group of people. It's there for everybody. You saw the scriptures. He said, I pour out my spirit on all flesh. Not some, not most, all. That was the promise. So now it's up to you. What are you going to do with what God gave you? Are you what are you going to do with it? The ball's in your court. You've got to use it. And you've got to believe that it's for me. It's not just for pastor. It's not just for Pastor P. It's not just for the elders. It's not just for the ministers. He said on all flesh. So this is your moment. This is your time. Everybody's standing. Everybody's standing. We're done. God is looking to do a new thing. And the new thing that he's looking to do is through and by the Spirit. Not by any other way. We try to figure it out. Well, let me, if I could do this, I could do this. We try to open up the textbooks. Well, maybe I can figure out where to go here. No, 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 no. You can't get this information on the Internet. I mean, the Internet is exhaustive. I mean, you can find just about anything in Google. But the only thing you can find in there are things that have already been revealed. Anything new that has not been revealed is still locked up in the spirit. I use this example all the time. You know, I I work for a wireless cell phone company. Wireless cell phone service works on a technology that's in the air that's called Spectrum. Spectrum was there when Moses was here. It just was not revealed. So they couldn't use it because they didn't know. In every era in time, everybody always thought they knew everything. I've heard people say, yeah, there are no new inventions. (laughs) What do you know? You only know what you know until somebody proves you wrong for what you know. The Spirit has already told us that we won't know everything. So that means there's always something that needs to be revealed. That means it needs to be seen again, brought back to our remembrance. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do with the time that you have? What are you going to do with the moments you have that are so precious? Are you going to continue to just live life according to the way you think you should live it? Or are you truly going to give up the way what you want for the Spirit? I hope it's the latter. So if there's one that needs prayer on this morning, if there's one that thinks, hey, you know what? This is something that I need to pray about. This is something that I need to touch and agree with. We want to pray. Maybe you don't know the Spirit. Maybe you're just like, I don't even know what the Spirit is. I just, you know, we can pray that God.
God will reveal the spirit to you. He wants all of us to have it. I think we've established that today. So now the ball's in your court. Is there one on this morning? 